Thank you. Great. Well, thanks very much. Thanks very much for inviting me here today. It's an absolute pleasure to be standing in front of a live audience again, just echoing what was said earlier on, although I had forgotten just how cold it is in these lecturers. So I'm going to stand here in my coat, if that's all right. So I did wrestle a little bit about what it was I was going to talk to uh, today. I wondered about whether we we're going to talk a little bit about uh, my own research or whether I should do some sort of uh, comparison of formal comparison about how we should use methods to predict individual outcomes. But then, serendipitously, I was invited to take part on a panel looking, reviewing grants for machine learning and got sent through the usual wodge of uh, PH, uh, PH, PDFs and I was uh, sifting through them, looking through them. And after I'd done about two or three of these, I realised I was having the same sort of emotional response to each one of them. Uh, and that was due to the fact that the ambitions that were being expressed in these grants and the way in which they were going to produce evidence to support those ambitions was completely mismatched. It was just, it just wasn't going to happen. And I just thought, well, that's, that's all a bit strange. Well, how did we get to such a point? Now, don't get me wrong, I've, machine learning, I do research in machine learning, I think it's a great technique. It's got a lot of potential. It's going to get us somewhere. It already is getting us somewhere, not necessarily in, in medicine, although the first trials are starting right now, but in society in general. So I'm not doing down machine learning, okay? But I just want to know uh, how we're going to get from where we are now to those sunny uplands that, that were being promised. And here are those sunny uplands that were being promised. These are the sorts of things that you see in the, in the discussions, you know, the ones we've all got to write. Unfortunately, when I was thinking about, well, what's come before these grants, you know, if this is the state of the art, what, what they're building on, uh, I looked in the literature. Unfortunately, there have been some formal uh, reviews of the machine learning literature published in very, very high quality journals. So there's one here from the BMJ looking at machine learning uh, techniques or machine learning studies. Uh, they wanted to find them, but they were quite, quite uh, exclusive about what they were including. So they were just going to look at studies across medicine, uh, making diagnoses uh, in randomized and non-randomized trials. So the randomized trials, there was only one, there was about six papers of those, but they all, several of them referred to the same trial. So they sort of excluded that. And they were left with about 81 studies, uh, non-randomized trials, I guess, using historical data. And they used what's called the PROBAS system, uh, which I didn't heard about before, but then read into is quite nice. It's a panel-based system in order to look at the quality of data, uh, quality of articles, uh, and essentially... Uh, rank their bias. And so you, you've got three different, um, three different categories here. The participants, you can see roughly about 50% of the participants that are being used in these studies are either biased explicitly or it's not clear whether they are or they aren't. Outcomes, we're pretty good at that. So what it is that we're actually measuring, what the, the numbers that we're actually using to make these diagnoses are appropriate. And I guess that comes from you know, all the research that we've all been doing over the, over the decades previously. But when we look at analysis, then we start to see that this is where there are starting to be problems, real problems here. People aren't making the right interpretations, aren't using the right designs. And overall, that's leading to a, quite a poor, uh, a, a poor literature. And so these are, this is some of the reasons here. Probably need to uh, select our data sets better. Probably need to do our designs better. But the other problem as well is overfitting. So on the right-hand side, you see a paper in Neuroimage, really great paper, a uh, bit more inclusive about what it's looking at, actually just looking at uh, imaging papers uh, in neuroscience. And one of the, lots of this is a very, very long paper, but one of the really nice uh, results from it is this mapping of accuracy and total sample size. Now, you would think, it wouldn't you, that as the sample size increases, you'd get a better sampling of the populations that you're trying to classify, uh, and that would mean that your classifiers would have been you know, more flexible and better to interpolate and so on and so forth, and so your, your accuracy would improve. Well, that's not the case. In fact, it's quite opposite. So as total sample size increases, the accuracy of the reported accuracy declines, and that is essentially for the two reasons. One of them well-known, foul draw problem, okay? We don't do very well, we don't publish. The second is the opposite, okay? Small sample sizes, lots of overfitting. Uh, so in other words, the algorithms only work on the data that they've been, uh, that they've been uh, trained upon, and they don't really generalize to uh, populations more widely. So what are we going to do about it? How do we make progress? Well, the first thing we can do is just use the techniques that we have to hand, very, very uh, robust techniques, 
I'm sure many of you have come across this, if not all of you, the receiver operating characteristic curve invented during the Second World War by the British in order to identify the, op the, the optimal operating uh, procedures for radar. Of course, that is surely the most important application where you've got to get it right, got to have reliable methods with high utility. And so the ROC curve uh, really fits the bill. It's a simple method. It just plots false positive rate against true positive rate. Clearly, you want as many true positive as possible, minimum number of false positives. So the perfect classifier lives in that top left-hand corner there. But generally speaking, you don't get the perfect classifier. Your machine learning algorithm, think of it just as a black box with an output. You know, we're just going to look at binary uh, methods or binary classifications here just for simplicity. So the output generally gives you a probability or a likelihood that a, a particular exemplar that's been given to the network, the train network, uh, belongs to one class or another, and you have to threshold it. So all you do is you vary your threshold systematically, and that changes the false positive, true positive rate. You draw your curve, and then you can just look at the area under that curve, and that tells you how good your classifier is relative to other methods. So that's all pretty straightforward stuff, okay? Key thing here, though, even if you use these methods, is to understand the context in which you're using them. So understand the application which you have, because not all true positives or not all false positives have the same cost. So if you're doing a stratified medicine study, in which case you know, you're giving a medicine to somebody and perhaps the misprescription of that medicine might be lethal, then clearly that's a very, very high cost. Okay? And you've got to bear that in mind where you decide where to operate on that curve. Also, the vast majority of medical tests are rule out tests, not rule in tests. So in other words, you go to your doctor, you've got some symptoms, they start off with the simplest thing at the beginning and then they'll work down the list, ruling each one out until you get to the more serious cases. So again, false positives in a rule out case, very, very unhelpful, okay? Because you're gonna take you off on places where you just really don't need to go. So it's not just the method, it's operating that method appropriately for the application that you have. And again, this is a, a way of uh, testing that algorithm, uh, getting it to work and then seeing just how, how it's performing. Basically two options. Uh, again, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Best thing, if you've got lots and lots of data, is to take a data set, chop it up into uh, a test set, take that test set, put it in a box somewhere, cover it up, leave it alone. Get yourself a validation set, which is about the same size as the test set, and use the rest in order to train your algorithm. You can use your validation test set to see how you're getting on, tune your parameters, so on and so forth. When that's all done to your satisfaction, open up the box, take out the test set, check it out, see how the performance, see what the performance was, and then stop. You cannot then go back. Okay. Now there are a lot of competitions that are being held now for machine learning methods, which do exactly that. So the test set is held by a central committee, and you submit your uh, algorithm, and they check it out. And I think that's a fantastic idea. So I would suggest to anybody who thinks they've got a world-beating machine learning algorithm, uh, take part in one of those competitions. The more common method is the careful cross-validation. This tends to be where the small sample sizes occur. Then you get you have to divide your data set up into so many folds. You take one fold out, that's your test. Use the rest for training, test, and then just swap the folds around. Eventually, you'll get lots and lots of results, one for each fold. Aggregate them, uh, and that's your result. That's great. That's unfortunately where quite a lot of the overfitting takes place. There is also a problem about whether you, you know, what size K you should use as well. And of course, as you increase the number of folds, then moving towards a sort of leave one out type of scenario, uh, then you get the test and training set difference maximized. That then leads to reducing bias, which is good. But it does increase the variance. So again, it's not simple. Depends on your applications. Which one are you going to use here? Now, I want to talk a little bit about that black box problem. So this has been a major issue for machine learning. So there's a lot of hype, if you like, a lot of uh, really great results. Uh, and then we suddenly find that all the discrimination and bias that we have in our own research is not just reflected uh, in these results but it's highlighted and really brought out and you know it's we've really got to try and think hard about what we're actually doing and make sure that we do things right so how do we go about understanding what our black box is doing well first thing of course is make sure that the it's representative, right? We've got the right data and we're doing the right design. 
Okay, so we've got to get that that right, that fundamental right. So I might say that one or two more times before the end of the talk because I think that is really the take-home message. But the other ways are just just to bring in some of the techniques that, that are coming along and some that are already well established. So interpretable AI is a really hot area at the moment, and this is where the algorithms themselves actually tell us uh, what they're doing in order to make the decisions that they make. Uh, and that's really quite exciting. As I say, a lot of heat around that, uh, and that's a real watch this space. Not particularly uh, available yet, but I think that's uh, really quite uh, quite exciting piece of future work. More common these days is a so-called explainable AI, and this uses other tools to interrogate a trained classifier to see how, or to try and understand how it works. So really they come down, there's, there's a couple of techniques. There's occlusion, which is quite an interesting method, although quite laborious, so you just sort of blank out bits of the input images, see how your trust classifier gets on, uh, and see how that works. As I say, quite tedious, takes a lot of time to get through it. Another method is salience networks. I think it's a little bit more sophisticated. It uses filters on the input images in order to highlight specific features so that in the output you actually get highlighted areas of an image in particular which tell you uh, what uh, that's where the, um, the algorithm has really emphasised the data in order to make the, uh, the um, to make the classification that it has. Whatever you do, though, the explanations must accompany the decision. Right? So no point waiting for two years when you've done a 1,000 or 2,000 classifications to find out that we've got all sorts of biases built into them, uh, because not only will that all obviously be terrible for the people who uh, received those incorrect decisions, uh, but it will also entirely undermine your credibility in your, in your, in your application, in your method and that's going to lead to the end of everything so explanations must come along at the same time not only that of course is if you're talking to patients you know you've got to have that explanation to hand so that when the patient asks you well you know what's why have i got that disease uh, you can tell them and i just want to finish off with ethics okay so i think generally speaking we do a really really great job uh, with our participants when we invite them in in person to do the assessments and take part in all our studies. I think right across academia, uh, you know, we've spent a lot of time and effort coming up with method or coming up with policies and procedures in order to treat people with respect and respect their safety and dignity and so on. And I think that's really, really worked. Perhaps we should be thinking, you know, translating those ideas into the machine learning area as well. And the problems that might occur from uh, not doing so have really you know, obviously been noted by uh, many people or many learned bodies around the world, government agencies and so on, charities and so on. And so there has been a sort of uh, lot of thinking about how we might go about you know, ensuring that ethics is at the centre of processing of, uh, uh, of our machine learning or developing our machine learning methods. And this is a a nice, um, a nice paper. Unfortunately, the, the references disappeared there behind some of the text. But never mind, this is a really good one. Chops it up in a really nice chops up. It's a sort of a review of all these bodies. Chops it up in a really quite nice way. Uh, I think you'll all uh, recognise many of those. But we just want to highlight honesty and transparency. Because let's not make any mistake about it, right? If you're being told that you've got Alzheimer's disease, you know, that's a life event. Right? That's something that's going to colour everything you do from, that, from the moment you get that diagnosis to the moment you die. So it's absolutely critical that if we're going to make those kinds of decisions supported by machine learning, that we uh, are honest about their performance and that we're transparent about the way that they make their decisions, the limits of their capabilities and how they come to decide on that particular decision. OK, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. Very interesting. Do we have any questions from the audience? Hi, John. Thank you for that. Just wondering if you thought about it in this context of ethics in particular, how um, machine learning might interact with where the field of um, neurodegenerative diseases seem to be going, looking at transdiagnostic rather than just kind of putting people in these separate boxes, just kind of trying to identify more like patterns of whatever it, cognitive change etc that might predict the uh, endpoint rather than f focusing on these um, different uh, 
you know, individual diagnoses and, and how do you think the two things are going to interact, right? Yeah, because but... we tend to use the labels to make the predictions, but if we're actually trying to get rid of the labels, what, what's left? Okay, so it's quite a lot in there. Um, so the first thing I think I'd say is that I agree that there's a lot of work on, uh, on the continuous outputs, essentially, you know, looking at cognitive decline or prognostics or whatever. That's quite a, still quite a, a young area for machine learning. Most of the machine learning e effort has been with binary classifications. You're either, in, you're either a case or a control or whatever it is. And I should say that the, there is a trial going on right now in Cambridge. I think people on, in the audience are involved with it, using machine learning method from T1 weighted images in order to make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so there's a randomized trial that's happening right now. So, whilst you know, those sorts of techniques, which I, I think are really quite interesting, we're using them ourselves, are you know, something we should look into. Binary classifications are happening right now in, a, in, well, in Cambridge, in a clinical context, making decisions about neurodegenerative diseases. So, I suppose that's kind of my answer, really. It's, it's interesting, but this stuff is actually happening. So, you know, I think it's prescient that we think about that now and think about doing it right. Okay, thanks.